the Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College has presented free talks for the public by best-selling authors and great thinkers on the college's Upper East Side campus. Hi, hope you enjoy it. Those of you who are writers know what I'm talking about. You have a little voice in your head drives you crazy. We're, We're dancing, dancing with words. Prancing with words. As a result of the 2020 coronavirus pandemic and required social distancing, public gatherings such as our remaining two talks for the spring semester have unfortunately been canceled. Thank goodness we've recorded it. Center Director Louis Frumkus has had each of the talks recorded for archives and to provide a copy of the talk to the speaker on DVD. We have some incredible scientists coming. That the universe just began. Given the need for intellectual stimulation during this troubling time, the Frumkiss Center is making many of our past talks available to view for a limited time each week. Stay tuned to our website for more information about the videos available each week. I'm just going to say a few words before I introduce uh, Stacy Sheff. One, I'm delighted that you're all here on this uh, godforsaken night. But it's not a blizzard, at least, right? So, so uh, that's good. Um, tonight is the launch of our uh, 2012 best-selling author series. Uh, we have an in what I think is a, a marvelous uh, lineup. Uh, beginning with Stacy Schiff and followed by Alice McDermott and then Alan First, Susan Isaacs and Stuart Woods. And then we will have our uh, great uh, thinker series starting with Steven Pinker and Rebecca Goldstein on uh, February 17th followed by Seth Lloyd, the quantum uh, physicist. And then uh, John, uh, John uh, Donahue, who is the head of brain science at uh, Brown, who is doing all kinds of incredible work on the cutting edge of science, where he's working with the brains of paraplegics and having them uh, just about be able to move things with thought. Uh, this is really stepping into uh, the next century. And then in, uh, in, on May 3rd, uh, uh, Lisa Randall is coming. Lisa Randall is, uh, how should we describe her, probably the leading figure, leading female uh, particle physicist in the world. And uh, she's the one who has um, played with all the 11 dimensions in string theory and added all kinds of new excitement. Uh, she's also a, an expert on the Great Hadron Collider, and she'll talk about that too. So we, and then we come to the Writers' Conference on June 9th, which is, extraordinary and uh, I don't want to tease you with it yet because we have to leave something. Uh, but let me begin by introducing Stacy now uh, and you're in for a treat. Um, throughout the Mediterranean, a strange madness hung in the air, ripe with omens and portents on extravagant rumors. The mood was one of nervous exasperation. It was possible to be anxious and elated, empowered and afraid, all in the course of a single afternoon. The time is 48 BC, and the author of these words is Stacy Schiff. Describing the atmosphere in late July when Cleopatra heard that the Roman Civil War a contest that pitted the invincible Julius Caesar against the indomitable Pompey the Great was about to collide with her own. She was mounting a war too. Of Stacy's book, Cleopatra, Simon Winchester has said it was destined to become a classic. And indeed, it did win the Pulitzer Prize. Ron Chernow, himself an extraordinary biographer, has said of Stacy, quote, even if forced at gunpoint, Stacy Schiff would be incapable of writing a dull page or lame sentence. I found that myself true to be true. And Ron is not alone in feeling this way. Stacy is actually a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner of a biographer, Ne Plus Ultra, who has won dozens of other awards, prizes, and accolades, and been accorded all the trappings of literary greatness as a writer and a scholar, which is why it gives me great pleasure 
to introduce her to you tonight as the lead-off speaker in our best-selling author, in the best-selling author series. After the talk, uh, uh, Stacy has, has offered to be gracious enough to sign books for anyone who would like to purchase them back there, and uh, we have refreshments. So that said, have a wonderful uh, experience. Stacy. Thank you all for coming out, and thank you for the lovely introduction. I hate to have to give accolades back, but I should confess I've only won one Pulitzer Prize. So I hope you'll listen to me anyway. I, I'm happy to accept another at any moment. And, and yeah, it's, I'm, a, I'm a little lowbrow, I know. And, and when I was in Portland recently, I got given a Nobel Prize by accident, I, and I gave that back too. So I, I, at least I'm honest. I mean, unaccomplished, but honest. Um, I was coming here tonight and I was thinking about a Margaret Atwood quote that many of you may have read recently where she writes <laughs> that wanting to meet a writer because you like his or her work is like wanting to meet a duck because you like pate. <laughs> and, and I did think, you know, why am I coming, why are you all coming out? Couldn't we just like have refreshments or something? Um, but Lewis has twisted my arm and I, I thought I would, I, I would talk about um, how the biographer ambles among his or her subjects, which to me anyway is a very difficult question to answer. Um, and I'll keep it short so that we have plenty of time for questions and cookies um, and Pulitzer Prizes. Um, it's always the first question people ask me, you know, how do you find your subjects? Um, and it always puts me in the mind of, of a of story which is perhaps apocryphal. Apparently, um, Philip Roth was once asked by a reader, where do you get your ideas? And he replied, I think of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a little bit glib, but um, in the biographer's case, there every everyone has given different reasons. Um, I put a few of them together. Sylvia Townsend Warner said she had a lot of reasons, but she had once written a book on a dare. Um, Harold Nicholson felt that you worked out of respect or affection for your subject. Um, my friend Linda Davis privately admitted to me that she wrote about Stephen Crane because he reminded her completely of her own father. Um, Judith Thurman thought about Robert Maplethorpe before she wrote her Colette book, um, but then she decided that was inappropriate because she was nursing a baby at the time. Um, Catherine Drinker Bowen was very blunt about um, why she did Queen Mary Tudor. I chose Mary Tudor, she wrote, because I thought she would make a lot of money for me. Um, and she puts it best, I think, you couldn't write about Tchaikovsky if you didn't know neurotic anxiety, Disraeli if you didn't know ambition, or Balzac if you didn't understand graphomania. But to my mind, the best answer is also something she writes elsewhere, which is that you pick the subject that takes you where you want to go. Um, and I have a private theory, too, which is, in my case anyway, I suspect that each book um, is in its perverse way a reaction against the previous book. Um, why would a relatively experienced, more or less sane biographer um, who reads neither Greek nor Latin um, attempt a life of a first century BC queen um, of whom no shred of documentation remains when, in fact, I am happiest in a dusty archive? And I think the answer to that question has something to do um, with the fact that my previous book had been about Ben Franklin, um, so I'm going to blame it all on him. Um, I had written about Franklin's eight years um, in France, which are the eight years um, of the American Revolution and the peace negotiation that follows. And for those eight years, the documentation is two and a half times greater, the American documentation is two and a half times greater than that for the rest of Ben Franklin's life combined. Um, and that's not counting the French documentation. Um, when he's living in France, Franklin is surrounded by a net of um, French spies, all of whom are surrounded by a net of British spies. And each of these men, as far as I can tell, was paid by the word because nothing is too irrelevant for them to report on. So we have, you know, Franklin's dinner menu, who came to visit, what his kids are up to, the state of his laundry. It was always impeccable, in case you're wondering. I mean, every single detail was recorded by this, you know, surveillance system, this double surveillance system. Um, and blessedly, um, as all repressive regimes keep good archives, all of this material has been saved and is brilliantly filed away at the Quai d'Orsay, the French State Department archives, Foreign Department archives, um, where it is also filed away with the reports of what the French government um, is telling the British government at the time, all of it lies, what the French government is telling 
its allies, the Spaniards at the time, equally fictitious, what the French government is telling the American rebels, also fictitious, and what the French ministers are saying to each other, which is more or less accurate. Um, so you have that massive documentation. You have everything that leaves Franklin's desk, all of it intercepted and returned to the French ministers. So you have those documents, one of which is, by the way, is a, is a copy of the Declaration of Independence, which is quite stunning to read. Um, and then you have um, all the newspapers, because in France at the time, you had a whole run of official French newspapers, and then you had the unofficial French newspapers. Um, another thing about the 18th century, of course, is that everyone alive writes a memoir. Um, and those people who don't write a memoir appear to own a newspaper. So it's just a massive, I mean, miles and miles and miles of documentation. Um, you also had John Adams, of course, trapped in Paris at this time, ostensibly to help Franklin, um, and with very little to do, and I, it seemed uh, in, in possession of a great number of pens, and he misses his wife dearly, so he's constantly writing home to Abigail about how much he abhors Ben Franklin. So needless to say, there was a lot of documentation, and I think after that, um, the idea of writing about someone for whom there was no shred of evidence whatsoever was highly appealing. Um, how did I wind up with Franklin? Um, I had this crazy, I'd, I had had um, this crazy idea to write about Nabokov and his wife, Vera. Um, before that. And that idea um, seemed utterly insane. That was an idea for which I generally apologized over the course of the five years I was working, um, except on three occasions. And those three um, felicitous occasions were these. They were the day Nabokov's papers were largely sold to the New York Public Library. So when I started that book, I thought, this is great. The documents will all be you know, here in New York. Because for me, the idea of traipsing halfway around the world to research a book was not highly appealing. Um, first of all, I should say it turned out that most of the documentation was in Switzerland, possibly the most expensive place to research a book in the world, um, and where I did have to spend a lot of time. But when, the first day I walked into the, the Berg collection at the New York Public Library, where Nabokov's papers all should have been, um, the archivist who had been spent a few years cataloging them Said, you know, came over to see me, and I, I said, I'm writing about Vera Nabokov. And he you know, threw his arms around me and said, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. And he, and he knew there was a book there before I did, in fact. So that was one of the three moments that saved my life. The other two were, one of them was in this neighborhood. I went to see Saul Steinberg, the artist who had known the Nabokovs. Um, and the first thing he said to me when I walked in, um, other than your handwriting is beautiful, was um, you could write about Vera without writing about Vladimir, but you could never write about Vladimir without writing about Vera. Um, and he went on from there. So that was one of those moments that kept me going for the next, you know, incredibly barren four years. And the last was um, in the Nabokov papers um, in Switzerland, which are in the son's apartment. There were bags and bags and bags of stuff, none of which had yet been filed or, or really gone through in any way. And there was a postcard that Vera Nabokov had written in 1924, just before her, after the two had met, but before they were married, in which she had written to a friend, um, there is a book to be written on the influence and inspiration that a literary wife bears upon her husband's work. And I just felt like that was the single most validating statement I cause was ever going to hear from her, she who had essentially erased herself from the page, from his existence, from the marriage. Um, this was a woman who went through the manuscripts um, and erased her own marginalia so no one would ever see it again. Um, and of course, I had, when I signed the contract to write that book, um, promised that I would work from her, her letters to Vladimir and his to her. His to her had survived. Hers to him never turned up. Um, and for years, that was my great dream. Now it is my ultimate nightmare that those letters will surface one day. Um, she seems to have destroyed them. It's unclear what happened to them. Um, so that was a, um, a trauma in itself. Um, that book was also um, interesting in that there were living, there were surviving people who weren't willing to talk, one of whom was Vera's sister, who was a very combative woman, um, then living in Geneva. And I would call her up and say, can I come and speak with you? And she would say no um, very, very rudely. And finally, I tried the, you know, I'm going to come and just sit on your doorstep until you'll see me tack. Um, at which point, she would say, if you sit on my doorstep, you will spend the night there. Um, it was like the runaway bunny had gone psycho or something. Um, so after her death, um, Dmitry Nabokov, actually, the son, actually called me and said, I have all her papers, and I suspect that's where my mother's letters to my father are. Um, and he had these shopping bags full of paper. So I took the next flight to Geneva and raced out to see them. 
And in fact, he did have bundles and bundles and bundles of shopping bags, all of which were full of postcards and receipts and tax returns, um, none of it in Vera Nabokov's hand at all. So um, you know, that was the kind of thing that made me think Ben Franklin sounded like a better, the 18th century sounded like a better idea. Um, I also had, during the course of that book, of course, Dmitri, the Nabokov son, uh, who lives in Switzerland but has never figured out the time difference between Switzerland and America, calling you know, at 3 or 4 in the morning because he just had had an amazing memory about his parents he wanted to share. So you can see why the phrase, no living relatives, you know, started to like recur in the back of my mind, like you know, triple shot cappuccino or you know, business class upgrade. I mean, it was just, get me a book where there's no family. Um, and, and two, and I should say with that book, there was a lot of, you know, you, you tend to think that the eyewitnesses um, are the thing you're most eager for. You tend to think that the documents tell the truth. And I guess in the course of both of those books, um, I came to realize that archives, that memories distort and that archives too can be very deceptive. Um, with the Nabokov book, there was a wonderful um, professor of literature, a very prestigious professor of literature, who had um, taken Nabokov's Russian literature course at Cornell. One of the oddities of the, about the Nabokovs was that, as some of you may know, Mrs. Nabokov went to every one of the classes her husband taught. Um, and for me, this was a thrill because I had this kind of Greek chorus of the Cornelians, all of whom were highly impressionable college students and remembered the couple vividly and had all kinds of crazy eccentric stories to tell about this you know, vaguely European, strangely European couple um, lost in Ithaca, New York and always kind of conjoined at the hip and their classroom antics. So I had, a, I had great material for them from the Cornell years. But I also had this story, for example, from um, a very well-established professor of literature who had been in Nabokov's class, his Russian literature class in the fall of 1945. Four, um, and tells a story about Nabokov arriving in class one day to test the students on their grasp of Russian. And he arrived in the class with a copy of Pushkin, which he sent around the room for each of the students to read aloud from. Um, and each one did in turn, massacring the Russian language one more gravely than the next. Um, Nabokov is in visible agony. His head is sinking to his chest. He can't believe what's happening to his native tongue. When the book lands in the hands of the only African-American student in the room who begins to declaim in this velvety, gorgeous Russian. And so Nabokov's head jerks up and he says, you know, where did you learn to read like that? And the student says, you know, PS 29 Moscow or whatever the equivalent was. And um, turned out to be Paul Robeson Jr. So, um, you know, it was, it's fab it was a fabulous, you know, story. You think, oh my God, I've hit gold. Um, so I called him to just confirm that the date was right and that I had the right, you know, the right classroom, the right frame for the story. And he said, it is a delicious story. The only problem is that I never took a course with Nabokov. <laughs> um, so that was the kind of thing that, again, makes you think, maybe 18th century subjects, not such a bad idea. Um, and for the Saint-Exupéry book, which was my first book, which my timing had been exquisite for because saint the French aviator, dies, aviator dies in 1944, but having flown at the end of his life with a bunch of young American pilots, all of whom, many of whom were alive when I began writing, as were all of saint Exupéry's ex-girlfriends. So I had, again, these two, as were some of the, the pioneers of French aviation, in fact, still alive. So I had a, a huge number of people to interview who had really never spoken um, to a biographer before, um, which was a huge vein of, of fresh material. Um, one of the most effective ones, or one of the most important ones, was the woman who had been saint Exupéry's longtime mistress in Paris, um, who was known to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, which I thought she would not be with me. I was wrong. Um, and to this day, there is a street in Paris I cannot walk down without breaking out in a cold sweat. Um, and here's what generally would happen. I would go to see her every Wednesday over a course of a couple of months. And um, her maid would let me in. And Nellie de Vogue, as she is, was named, she's no longer alive, I'm so sorry to say, um, would keep me waiting for 10 minutes or so. And then she would stride into the room very majestically. And she would say, oh, you're still here in Paris, which should have come as no surprise since I went to see her every Wednesday. Um, are you, are you still, is your husband here? And, and I would say, for a long time I was stupid and honest, no, he's back in New York by himself. To which she would reply, how do you know he's by himself? Um, and so every interview would get off to this kind of, you know, she was trying to keep me off my game, combative start, and ended with, 
the fact that she had, in fact, vast amounts of paper. I still, to this day, don't know how much, pa how much of Santi Chabelli's papers she had, which, as she reminded me every single time, I am leaving to the French Library, but they will not be opened until 50 years after you die. So, and I think, I think the date is now 30 years in the future, so maybe I'll still be alive. Um, I admit that when I found some um, highly unflattering documents about Madame de Vaugouet in the American State Department archives, I did take the liberty of sharing them with her. Um, and I think I actually doing so did wonders for our relationship. Um, and the other thing that did wonders for our relationship was my having found um, the American girlfriend in whose home, whose New York apartment, saint exupéry wrote The Little Prince. And what was strange about these two women is that um, they looked almost identical. Um, someone once said that saint exupéry's taste in women was very consistent. He liked them tall, blonde, and titled. Um, and these two women were really mirror images of each other. And when I had mentioned to Madame de Vaugouet that I had found Sylvia Reinhardt, the other woman, uh, believe me, she was suddenly so more interested in me than she had ever been, um, and was drilling me as to what had gone on between the other between Santi Chibrilli and Sylvia in the bedroom. So there was a quite there was a real reversal in the in the relationship. What do you look for in a biographical subject in the first place? Some kind of resonance, I think, um, is necessary. That it's a collaboration of some kind, even if it's not necessarily a willing collaboration. And there has to be something instinctively right about it. I mean, sometimes you know you just can't follow Olympic curling, and sometimes you know you can't write on a particular subject. You're not willing to be blind for five years with Milton, or depressed with Carlyle, or neurotic with Florence Nightingale, or in rehab with Lindsay Lohan. That's my next book. Um, you hope to be able to um, approach your subject with some kind of judicious and impartial compassion. Um, you know that people do all kinds of senseless and contradictory and counterproductive things, but you, the biographer, are meant to approach those things with um, a sense of understanding, clear-sightedness. Um, you're meant to notice when, for example, a man writes the same letter to his mistress that he had written 13 years earlier to his wife. Um, that's an especially unattractive quality in anyone, but particularly in someone who will go on to establish a reputation as the century's most inventive and most original prose stylist and whose name is Nabokov. Who would be the um, ideal biographical subject? Um, someone who lived after the advent of photography. Um, someone who had been the star of his penmanship class in grade school um, and thereafter writes in English that positively sings. Um, oh, I should say that there was a lot of Lafayette that does not end up in my Franklin book. Uh, for the simple reason that I could not read Lafayette's handwriting. Um, and I mentioned this one day with great embarrassment um, to Peter Gay, the great historian, um, who said to me, he said the most consoling thing. He said, Stacy, don't you know Gay's law of history? And I said, no, Peter, what's that? And he said, if you can't read it, it didn't happen. <laughs> um, it's always an advantage to have a quotable subject, maybe not too quotable a subject. I, I pity the Oscar Wilde biographer. Um, it seems to me that that's like walking down the street behind a supermodel. Um, and the subject's papers should be accessible but not too accessible, like within a three-hour drive of your front door. Um, I should say, as I did earlier, that author authoritarian governments keep the best archives. They file them well. They know where their people were at all times. They know where the money is. They've traced everything. And, they, and all of this stuff is splendidly normally preserved. Um, the Russian materials on, the, on Vera Nabokov's family were, in fact, brilliant because none of that material had, as, as Jews living in Russia before the revolution, everything they did had been documented. Um, you want your subject to have had friends and confidants, but all of them with photographic memories, but none of whom has spoken to the previous 15 biographers. Um, you don't want the recycled stories. And those associates should not be legion. In other words, you don't want to have to interview every member of the 1969 NASA team. You want someone whose name rings immediate bells, but who's not overly familiar, someone about whom we know something, but about whom we don't know much at, much at all, really. And you want someone who died young, Mozart, Keats, Pocahontas. And then once you've satisfied all of those criteria, um, you realize you want something else, too, with this, in this person with whom you're going to spend 10 or 15 years, or 5 or 10 or 15 years. Um, you actually want to like him, too, which is why I have several times cozied up to the idea of writing about Groucho Marx and then run in the other direction. Um, anyway, I think I'll stop there. And if you have questions, we can, um, we can discuss them. Thank you.
Yes. I've got two questions. The there is the latest. Um, the line that Lewis read from your textbook about the rumors of course of the when I read that, so my, my question is, did you find documentation for that or did you intuit it? And my second question for you is, how much time did you spend when you wrote for the actor sort of time traveling and trying to get into, into the, the time and to the order to ponder and intuit what was going on since there was such a vast research gap? That's, those are great questions. Um, you know, it's funny, when Lewis was reading that line, I was racking my brains. I didn't make it up, because I have a lousy imagination for starters. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Cicero and someone else combined. It's in the footnotes. Um, and, and, it, and, and it's completely stolen from them. I mean, there is this, um, there is this line about it, there being a sense of great dread and the excitement turning to apprehension by evening. I'm mean, completely, completely cribbed from whoever it is I've mentioned in the notes. Um, and that sense re re reverberates through most of the classical authors writing through about the period. And there was a lot of that. There was a lot of taking what one person said and what another person said and basically triangulating. In other words, um, knowing that, these, that many of these men were writing from different perspectives many years later, trying to go back to who was writing closest to the events um, and filtering the other voices through the one closest to the events. Um, how much time I spent, but the research was probably about three years, but you raise a, a very good point, which is that this was a difficult book, that was a difficult book to write in that I couldn't stay with her. I mean, I really felt like I was living with my other subjects. With Cleopatra, because there's no, it's impossible to be intimate with her in any way. It's impossible to know what she was ever thinking. Her world was so vastly, everything about her world is completely different from ours. I mean, the, the winds don't blow in the same direction. The geography was off, the calendar was off, the years go backwards, the religion isn't the same, I mean, nothing is the same. Um, the rules of maternity aren't the same in a family where you kill your children. I mean, it just, everything had to be rethought every day for me. It was almost as if I went home at the end of the day and then have to spend an hour or two getting back into it when I got back to the office the next day. So there was, I felt as if it, I went in fits and starts and didn't really inhabit her world continuously the way I had with the others. Um, and there was a real sense if I ever, you know, if I went away for a research trip of having to tunnel back into the material. Um, and, and I felt she eluded me more because the documentation is so sparse and because the world was so, was so much more of a leap for me than anything else has been. And even when you go there, it's not there. I mean, truly, there is no there there in Cleopatra's case. You're in Alexandria. There's almost nothing of Greek Alexandria that survives today. And the best bet is to go out into the desert in the eastern Sinai, where um, you can see where she had been camped on the, on the border of Egypt um, when she comes back to, um, to the palace to meet Julius Caesar. And there, you really get an unadulterated sense of what her world looked like. Um, thanks to the fact that it's a military zone and no one's been able to build there. But otherwise, it was very hard to either grasp it or stay with it for me in any way. Yes? So what made you choose her as your subject? Uh, can't someone else answer that question? Um, uh -huh. You know, it had been, Cleopatra had been on, on the on the list of possible subjects, which is always a kind of funny list to look at because if you put these subjects together, they would have nothing in common. Um, before Ben Franklin, um, I should add it was my husband's idea and the family joke began, became always, I'll write about it when they find her diaries. I mean, it seemed insane to try to write about Cleopatra. Um, and in that intervening time, I think, seriously, the, 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 the ridiculous amount of documentation with Franklin had made me think, and the ridiculous amount of documentation with Franklin and the fact that even given that documentation, I couldn't answer basic questions about Franklin. I mean, we don't know who the mother of Franklin's son was. Miles and miles and miles of paper and you can't answer a question like that. You don't know what's going on in Franklin's mind when he's in Paris, even though we have letters he writes every single day. So I, I guess I had begun in a way to feel as if you could have all the paper in the world and still be at a loss. And then I went, and then I had been writing a lot of essays. This was the run up to the last election. And I've been writing a lot about women in power, women in politics. I mean, these were the Hillary Obama years. And I became rather enchanted with, the whole, with all of those questions, which led back rather neatly to Cleopatra. And I began to think that you could do a different kind of biography. You could do a sort of 
punk a truncated moments biography, you know, best hits of Cleopatra kind of thing, where if you could, you could animate a scene of hers with Mark Antony and a scene of hers with Caesar, if you could just skip from the one thing we know to the next thing we know, you could probably string a book together. I didn't think originally that I could write a traditional narrative as I ended up doing. And so it was, a, it was some combination of those things. And, and then I walked into my agent's office one day and said, could you sell a book by me based on one word? And he said, what's the word? And I said, Cleopatra. And he said, goodbye, I have to make a phone call. So that was, you know, when that happened. Yes. I wondered if you ever used um, literature like Shakespearean plays or things of that nature where she is mentioned or described. You know, I tried to stay away from the literature. Um, because as much as I say I have no imagination, I'm highly suggestible. And I had a feeling that if I really, if I, I have never watched the Elizabeth Taylor movie. And that was because I felt that if I watched the movie, I would write about Elizabeth Taylor. Um, I, it would all be over for me. Um, and in fact, I've been meaning to do so for now for five years. Um, I did read the Shakespeare, I read the Shaw, I read the Dryden. I tried to read them more to see what people had done to, to or with Cleopatra than to take them as any kind of historical document. And the same was true, um, I mean, our, our most juicy account, our, our most sensational account of Cleopatra is actually Lucan, who's a poet writing much closer to her age than most of the chroniclers, um, but he's writing sensationalistic poetry and he's writing, um, he's using her as a sign of oriental decadence. So as much as the poetry, you know, just shimmers on the page, and this image of Cleopatra is the sort of champion um, Eastern seductress, I discounted that as well. So I read those things, but I tried to keep those accounts out of her story, except to say, here's what men have done to her. Or, you know, when she appears before Caesar, um, she is most likely wearing her clothing, even though all of those centuries of portrait painters have preferred to have painted her half-dressed. Um, it works better on the, you know, on the canvas. So I, I mean, I played with it, but I didn't use it in any way as documentary evidence. It's kind of hard to avoid Elizabeth Taylor. Do we have other questions? Lindsay Lohan is selected to play Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stacy. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful talk. I did. And uh, Stacy will go back there for a little while and sign books for anyone who would like. And you can have cookies and coffee and ask her any further questions.